Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to EWTN's Family Celebration Live Show. It's so good to be with you today. What a beautiful opportunity we've had to come together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to be invigorated in our faith and mm -hmm. to come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of what it means to be a Catholic in the world today. And I'm so pleased to be joined here on set and stage with Father Mitch Pacwa and the beautiful Joy Pinto and her handsome husband, Jim Pinto. <laughs> Now, we have received some questions from individuals who have sent them in via EWTN's Facebook page, and we're going to get to those in just a moment. But, you know, I thought we would begin by developing this beautiful theme that is ours through the course of, of our day today. And, you know, I was thinking, Father Mitch, that Mother Angelica, of course, had such a deep devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. And we've heard so many fascinating stories of Mother, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, uh, all of the time, took everything before the Lord. And in her resting place there in Hansville, in, in the uh, beautiful church there that is the church underneath the main shrine, um, that beautiful passage from Corinthians is etched and I thought maybe we would talk about that for a moment because I think it's so important for us to understand the power that we have in Eucharistic adoration. Mm -hmm. And it says this, and this is the uh, New American Bible translation. It starts off at it's 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says this, where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, mm -hmm. there is freedom. And then 18 says, all of us gazing on the Lord's glory with unveiled faces are being transformed from glory to glory into his very image by the Lord, who is the Spirit. Sitting before the Blessed Sacrament is transformative, and it brings liberation and freedom. Mm -hmm. A couple things that we should keep in mind is that in Eucharistic adoration, we are beginning what we will do in heaven for eternity. This is something like, by rough analogy, the appetizers before the banquet. Heaven being the banquet, which it often is described as being. And to understand that we need to be ready for what's coming. Or perhaps uh, another way to look at it if you've ever been to a symphony orchestra, before the symphony begins, the musicians are practicing, they're getting their various instruments ready and tuning up to the first violinist. They want to make sure they're in tune. And when we are in adoration, it's tuning us up for the eternal symphony of heaven. It's getting us prepared so that we will be able to join in the music God sets before us for eternity. It's important to see that's the part where it says he takes us from glory to glory. That beautiful instruments that we are, we need to have the sour notes taken out. You know, we have to purify ourselves. And spending that time before the Lord is to do that. And with the ultimate goal being in a related passage from St. John in 1 John chapter 3, where he says that we shall see Christ as he is mm. and we will become mm. like him that this viewing of Christ makes us more and more like him, this spending time. And I think that's one element that we should consider as part of what we are doing. Yeah, and I love that part in that passage um, in, in verse 17, that, you know, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I think that there is that liberating effect 
that comes by sitting before the Blessed Sacrament. And I'm thinking about this joy in relation to the fact that, you know, we live in a world today that wants to inhibit us, uh, that wants to, in a way, make us apologetic for being Catholic, for being Christian. Sitting there with our Lord helps us to be liberated that we might be those proclaimers of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and the saints of this our day and time that we're called to be. Yeah, and the beautiful part about being in adoration is, you know, we go in there to adore him, to love him, to worship him, to give him the best of ourselves. The freedom that he does to us, he sets us free from ourselves. That's right. Because sometimes we could be our own worst enemies. And it's like if we stay stuck in our self-talk and we don't listen to who God says who we are, like, oh, joy, you're here, my beloved daughter. Let me undo you, <laughs> right? Because we come in with our cares, our concerns, our worries, our heartaches, our miseries, our sorrows, all of our stuff, our struggles in our living, in our being, in our doing. And you know, when we leave adoration, we might still have all those things. But the encounter to be with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords changes us. Mm -hmm. So that interior work happens. And all of a sudden, there's fortification, there's renewal, there's strength that you and I don't possess. I, I, I don't possess it, I know it, because when it's operating in me, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> Jesus is alive and well. Like, this is a miracle. It's like you can have an out-of-body experience and experience God's working inside of me. Yeah. But it's when we stop, and then he sets us free from us so that we are then called to do the great work that he's called us to do. As St. Catherine of Siena has said, become who you are, mm -hmm. and you will set the world on fire. Yeah. So don't be anybody else. Just be you, but be the best version of you, and let him set you free from you so you can become who he's called you and designed <laughs> you to be. And that's the transformative power, right? That's the transformative power. So, Jim, when we think about that transformation, and Father, as you put it, to become another Christ, to become like Christ, mm -hmm. uh, I know that both you have that beautiful devotion to the holy face of Jesus. Yeah. Talk with us a little bit about that in light of Eucharistic adoration. Mm. Well, the prayer that we work with daily is this. Heavenly Father... I embrace your grace today so that I might not think of another, speak to another, or touch another without first looking for your face mm -hmm. in the other. I ask all this through Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God with skin, God made poor, God with a face. So what we're doing in that prayer is practicing the mediation of Jesus Christ, who is the only mediator and advocate. Who, develop, who allows us to mediate, but he is the mediator. And I found in my own life that I wasn't honoring that. It's, always ha it's happening all the time. He's mediating right now. But I honor his mediation in saying that I have no right to look at you or to give an answer to you without going through Jesus Christ. I have no right to touch or look at my wife without going through the mediation of Jesus Christ. So we're always seeking the face of Christ. Everyone, all the time, especially in our pregnancy medical center, these women are coming in, guys with them, and we have, no, we have to change the way we see. Change the way you see. They may not change, but you'll change. And so I have to see Jesus in them. Now, there might be demonic power with them as well, but somehow Jesus is in there. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, through Eucharistic adoration, then, you know, we come face to face with the Lord more fully. We're practicing his face in other people. As you do it to the least, you do it to me. But then, in a real sense, his face is there in Holy Eucharist. So we're before his face. In, in our center, we have a monstrance in a tabernacle, monstrance in the tabernacle. And we're gazing into his face as women are trying to decide mm -hmm. if they're going to 
kill the baby within them. Yeah. So most of my adoration takes place as women are making this decision, mm -hmm. life and death. Father John Paul comes and he celebrates the Eucharist periodically and he wants to know what's going on. Well, in this room, in this room, we have a girl 24 weeks that's considering abortion. And then when we're done with Mass, so he's celebrating Mass while people are deciding what's going to happen if the child's going to live or die. So this is an interesting way to seek God's face, to do Eucharistic adoration. And then Father John Paul will take the monsters. What room are they in? And so he would just stand up and aim the Lord that way. So it's a really interesting way. It's an interesting way to to see how we're seeking the face of God in these babies, praying for these mothers. We also have a basket, we call it a Moses basket, and in there are all the images of babies whose mothers we work with who said, I still want an abortion. Yeah. So all those babies are there in a Moses basket before the altar and Eucharistic adoration. And we're praying for them, we're praying for their mothers, so this is just, uh, I don't know too many people that get to adore the Lord and seek his face in the midst of Calvary yes. that's kind of taking place right there. So it's a very intense, you know, in one sense you can relax, in another sense you can't. But I also know when I go into there to adore the Lord, the Lord has said to me, with all that's going on in there, my own life, when I get before the Lord in Eucharistic adoration, often I think he says to me, everything's done, Jim. Everything's done because he doesn't live in time. Now, I don't know what that means. It's not done for me. I still got to, you know, I don't feel, he's done. everything is all over now. And somehow I get peace. I still have to do the work here, but somehow it's all done. Mm -hmm. And that gives me a great deal of peace. Yeah, you, when you think about the work that the two of you are engaged in, this is tremendous work. You're, mm -hmm. you're, facing, you're facing life there and the possible extinction of life. And this is a, 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 a very significant moment in the lives of these women who are about to make a very significant decision, not only affecting them, but affecting the children that they're carrying. And so how do you find in your own personal life and in your work that Eucharistic adoration, the reception of all of the sacraments, really encourage you and enable you to move forward? Because this can be grueling. Yeah. I mean, this is very distressing. Yes. And the intensity of it yes. could be overwhelming. Yes. So how do you see the benefit of that personally? Joy, how do you see the benefit well, of it? Well, it's a game changer. It's everything. Mm -hmm. um, because it is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And it is a power encounter every single day between light and darkness. Yeah. It's warfare all day long. And so I'm just a human being, and I'm counting on God Almighty to show up and do miracles mm -hmm. among us among my staff, among my skilled sonographers and nurses, and he does. And Jesus is there. And at the end of the day, when the street has come into the center, and believe me, there are people who come in, they're straight street. And when I tell you we are seeing the worst of humanity, and women have lost their way, we don't know how to be feminine anymore. And women are giving themselves over to usury. And it, it, it just like, Jesus, where are we? And every day we get to restore the dignity, value, and worth back into that human being. And we get to say things that she's never heard in her whole life. Mm -hmm. First of all, that Jesus loves you, yeah. no matter what you've done. And we can help you. And that's always my question. What can I do to help you today? Yeah. Because I want to help you. And this I is, want to lift you up from this muck and mire and just help. What can we do? And this is where you see all of this, you smell all of this, it's all there, and yet the Lord is saying, change the way you see. You don't mm -hmm. deny the mountains of what's going on. This is my daughter. This is a child of God. This is your moment. You have no right to relate to her directly. You can't speak to her. But there's a great dropout rate in pregnancy medical centers because we're looking at the baby, and we know what the baby looks like, and we know what's going to happen to that baby. And this woman's about, it's, it's such a big thing. So finally, you got to give it over to the Lord and say, hey, life and death is really in your hands. We're just doing the best we can. Unless you light a fire here and awaken somebody, even if you do, they can say no. God, we give this to you. If you don't, yeah. you burn out and you just leave because it's an unseen thing that's going on. You know, half the church really doesn't know what's going on. you got to beg for money to get things done. And yet every day I'm dealing with, if we don't succeed, our clients are killed. Mm -hmm. If we don't succeed, my client is killed. And that's, that's tough to live with. Unless you know the Lord, Eucharistic adoration, you go there and say, he loads you say, you can't handle this. And once you say, I can't handle this, you got to take it, then you can go on. If you don't, 
you're going to be a very angry person yeah. at the church and at everybody else. You don't know what's going on. But they don't know what's going on. We're seeing them face to face. We're seeing Jesus in them face to face. Yeah. And I think that this is one of the areas where uh, we can all grow is in recognizing and realizing the impact that the sacramental life has, Eucharistic adoration being an outgrowth of that, uh, in, in our daily activities. And Father, here you are, you're a man of God, you're a priest. How do you see Eucharistic adoration affecting the way in which you minister to others and what it is that you can bring to others? For me, it's something absolutely necessary. It, listening to retreats, that Archbishop Sheen had given years ago, and about when I was in graduate school, about 81 or so, uh, a very fine couple, uh, parents of 10 children, you know, who just loved the Lord so much, gave me copies of those retreats. And a point that Archbishop Sheen constantly made was the necessity of a priest spent making a holy hour spending the hour before the Blessed Sacrament, preparing your sermons before the Blessed Sacrament. So that, uh, and one of the things that I've done when writing my books, I write them in the chapel before the Blessed Sacrament. I bring up my computer. This is how John Paul II used to write. From the time he was a young priest, uh, after the war, he would uh, write with a pencil. Later on, he got a pen when things got better. Eventually, as a bishop, he had a typewriter and then a computer as pope. He just moved on up the hierarchy <laughs> and, the, and improved the equipment. But it was always bringing what we say to the people of God and what we write with the question to Jesus, what do you want me to say to your people? Yes. This, it's, it's not, you know, being fascinated with my own insights. It's rather asking our Lord before I prepare a homily or, or write a book or whatever it might be or prepare my shows, what do you want me to say? And it's engaging our Lord in that dialogue. And this can apply way outside of sermon preparation or book preparation. How many of you have said to me today or the last few days that you've been here in Alabama, my kid has left the church, they won't baptize my grandbabies, and so on and on and all, and very difficult problems. And what should, you ask me what I should say. Well, really, you should be asking Jesus. Yes. Spending time before Him in the Blessed Sacrament and asking our Lord, what do you want me to say to my children? It might not be the first thing that comes to mind because you've already said a lot of things over the years to your kids and they never listen. <laughs> Mom, are you here? No. <laughs> uh, but, it's, but it's rather asking our Lord what should I say? And when do you want me to say it? Not just that it comes to my mind, but when do you want me to say what you want me to say? That's a way to approach so many of the problems we have. And it might also be with your spouse, might be with a parent, all sorts of possibilities, but asking our Lord the second thing I would just say, too, when you mentioned earlier about the part in that quote from Corinthians regarding freedom, we also need to be before the Blessed Sacrament in order to have the virtue of courage. Mm. Because the world is trying to intimidate us. That's right. Over 300 churches have been burned or desecrated since 2020 in this country. The federal government won't investigate who's doing it. They won't. And we see forces on the left that are trying to intimidate us about what we do for life, what we do about human sexuality, what we say about marriage. Google still 
edits us out and all sorts of things go on. We see that the, um, <laughs> the FBI is trying to investigate Catholics who go to Latin Mass. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I said the other day, what are they expecting, secret messages to Julius Caesar? <laughs> what a bunch of dopes. <laughs> and when they said it was only in Richmond, either Mr. Ray, Christopher Ray, was lied to or he's lying because it wasn't just in Richmond. It was also in Oregon and in Los Angeles. And we, there may be other places that they haven't revealed to us because they're, they're dripping this out. Why are they trying to intimidate us? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ frightens them mm. and they want That's us right. to be frightened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True word. Absolutely. And I need to go before Jesus and I need to hear him say to my heart, be not afraid. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Woohoo! <laughs> so I am absolutely convinced that we are living in the latter part of the latter days. Not saying the end times. But I am saying that we've been in the latter days, right, since the resurrection and ascension of our Lord yeah. Jesus Christ, and it's 2,000 and some years later now than it was then. So we are moving towards a, a crescendo that's going to take place. And I think about St. Louis de Montfort in True Devotion, and he says that God is going to raise up, get this, the greatest saints who have ever been in the latter days. <laughs> and I think that we're gathered here with a wonderful, wonderful group of people who God is calling to be mm -hmm. saints. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about you, Father, hearing our Lord in your heart, being able to determine what it is that God is asking us to do and how it is that we're being called to execute what it is that we're being called to do. So a very practical question. You know, how do we hear the voice of God? And how do we know how it would be that the Holy Spirit would have us execute what it is that God is asking us to do. Basically, discernment. How do we discern? You asking me? I'm just asking oh, in general. <laughs> well, I'll answer quick. In discernment, what, we have to listen. <laughs> and we don't do that well. And we have to get quiet. And we have to get freed from the phone and all the devices and everything. And we have to be before the Lord and here, we have to have our ear to God's heart. We have to dial away. We have to come out of the darkness. We're in darkness every day at the center. And we have to come out of that. And one of the things that we do, even at the end of the day, we have a cleansing prayer. Because mm -hmm. we get taken into bedrooms. We hear things that you didn't even know existed. And we need to be cleansed because we've just been slimed all day. And we have to believe that God's in charge. We have to believe that the best is yet to come. We have to believe that. And so, but we have to listen. We have to discern. We have to be in the Word of God. We have to read His Word. We have to know who He is. We have to know our marching orders so that we're not confused. And we have to go to confession, and we have to do the sacraments, and we have to live and love and just be who God's called us to be, and don't compromise this with this world. This world has nothing for you. Nothing. Nothing. But we have Jesus, and Jesus is going to turn this. We are on the cusp of something. Yes, we are. I don't know what's coming, but I know who's in charge of what's coming, and that's where I put my <laughs> faith, my hope, and my trust. But we're on the cusp of something, so we better wake up and pay attention and listen. Uh, amen. Amen. Yeah, and I think that that's true. Yes, of course. I think that God does make his will known to us, and he makes it known in precisely the ways that you say, Joy, in this listening to the Lord through sacred scripture. How often do we open sacred scripture mm -hmm. and something pops off the page? Or, Father, in a homily, the priest says something, and suddenly, 
boom, we know that's it. Then we have to do what you said, and that's the courage to act on it, right? The courage to act. So let's talk about that execution, the acting on what it is. James says, you know, if all we do is hear the word and we do not act upon it, what happens to us, right? Mm -hmm. We're deceiving ourselves. We just have a minute for you, Father. So I'm going to ask you to <laughs> give it to us quick. Yeah. I, I would say very briefly. One, we have to make sure that what we're hearing is what God has already revealed, that there are objective norms for what God, he's not going to say, I want you to discern whether or not you should commit murder. No, <laughs> you don't, what about me and adultery? Should I commit adultery? No, <laughs> there are objective norms and we listen to that. But then once we accept what God reveals, we have to pay attention to the way he moves our hearts with his peace a peace that surpasses understanding. And that peace will be the guide to the choices we can make, but always within line of what God has already revealed as objectively true. Despite what the world says about the lack of truth, we believe Jesus who is the truth. Yeah, amen, amen to that, Father. Amen. So I think that that brings us to the end of our time here with Jim and Joy and Father Mitch. And we're going to take a little break and we're going to have other guests with us on the other side of that break. Thank you so very, very Thank much. You. Thank what you. What wonderful, wonderful help and guidance and direction you've given us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everybody. I am so pleased to welcome to our set today Father Wade Menezes, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, David Anders, and Father Chris Alar. And we're going to continue our discussion. As we were getting started, Father Wade leaned over and he said, Blessed are you among men. <laughs> And indeed, I truly am. You know, as we went to the break there, we were having a, a lively discussion with Father Mitch and Jim and Joy Pinto about the challenges that we're facing today and the way in which Eucharistic adoration and, of course, reception of the sacraments of the church encourage us and enable us to meet those challenges. So I, I think it would be a good idea for us to kind of uh, delineate what some of those challenges are and how it is that we as Catholics are being called forth and being gifted with the graces that we need to go into this. And I think it's important to remember that God calls us to a mission, but he always gives us what we need for that mission, right? He equips us that way. And I want to go to you, Deacon, first, uh, because you and I chatted uh, a little bit uh, earlier this week uh, about your trip to Papua New Guinea and you were uh, receiving a lot of feedback from young people and the issues that we're facing here in this United States is also infecting every other country and continent in the world as well. And how do you see bringing the great gift of Holy Eucharist, reception of Holy Eucharist, and then adoration of our Lord Jesus Christ into those challenges that we're facing that we might be, you know, more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Yes, amen. Uh, so 
the issues that they were bringing up were about marriage, transgender, uh, all, the, all the typical issues that we're hearing here. But it was just interesting to hear in those other countries that, hey, wait a minute, these young people are having deep, serious questions and thinking about these things in a very serious and powerful way. And, and one of the other things that, um, in Papua New Guinea particularly, they have a, the, one of the highest domestic violence rate in the world. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I've got to, get, I've got to address this, yes. right? So when I spoke to the men, I, you know, how do you do a paradigm shift in, in how we think about women, right? And so thinking about the Eucharist and the Blessed Mother, I, I, I reminded these men that the Blessed Virgin Mary was the first monstrance, right? She was the first vessel that held in the tabernacle of her womb the body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus. When she went to see her kinswoman Elizabeth, that was the first Eucharistic procession, right? And when she got to Elizabeth's house, she greeted Elizabeth and John the Baptist leapt in her womb. Why? He was giving adoration, right? He was, the monstrous walked in and John the Baptist began to adore. It just starts to shift your thinking, you know, because now you're connecting the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Eucharist, and how is this going to form how I think about women. You know, because every man in his heart of hearts, he wants the monstrance. He wants the monstrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you point out something so beautiful there too, and I think that that is the, the, the giftedness of authentic femininity, uh, being women who are called to bring life to the world. If, in fact, it agrees with our state in life, and, and biologically it's ca we're capable, uh, physical life, but always, in every case, spiritual life. And our Blessed Mother, I think, gives us the way in which we as women achieve that. And Father Wade, talk with us a little bit about how it is that as women we're called to emulate that and how it is that men are called to recognize that reality about who the woman is. You know, John Paul II wrote a lot about the feminine genius, as we know, uh, talking about natural gifts found within that feminine genius. Women are naturally nurturers, comforters, nesters, and they don't need to be physical mothers to express those traits. He didn't live long enough, I don't think, to explain more about the masculine genius, which is provider, protector, defender. Uh, if a husband and father, for example, the priest in the home, the Christ figure in the home. And then he went on to say, in regards to the feminine genius and talking about the men, it's not that they can't share with one another those traits, they can. Uh, the, the, the phrase we've all, we've all heard, mama bear, right? Mm -hmm. So indeed a woman can be a provider, a protector, a defender, uh, and, and a man could be a, a nurturer, a comforter, a nester. All Pope St. John Paul II was saying that within each gender, male and female, he created them. In his own image and likeness, he created them. These are their particular gifts that are natural to male and female. And I think that's a message that we need to get out today that is um, supplemented by a strong spiritual life in our Catholic Christian circles and to share this with our Protestant brothers and sisters, this gender ideology as given to us by John Paul II to help it grow and flourish. You know, the one thing I love, love about Eucharistic adoration even as a layman, and I've been a priest now for 23 years, even as a layman who was already led to adore the Lord and doing holy hours, especially during my college years, uh, I never, never met a regular adorer who was left of center of the chair of Peter, and I never met an adorer who was ultra right of the chair of Peter. I always met faithful, regular adorers who were right in line with the chair of Peter. They swerved neither left nor right of, of the teaching magisterial chair, and, which is faithful to Scripture and tradition, of course. And with a topic as important as this today, uh, the uh, gender ideology, for example, but uh, other life issues, uh, euthanasia, abortion, we can see the importance that Eucharistic adoration plays to help us live more fully our humanity mm -hmm. and what that humanity is meant to be. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully said, Father. Uh, Dave, you know, you, you've written that beautiful book uh, on how the Catholic Church saved your marriage, um, coming into the faith, obviously, uh, from a Protestant mm -hmm. denomination. You could see the, the richness and the fullness of our Catholic teaching. How has that impacted 
your life personally, uh, in, in your, your husbandry, as well as within the parenting of your children. Thank you so much. So I, I wish I could tell you that becoming Catholic had already made me a saint. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not the case. That is not the case. But it has turned a lens on the particular faults, habitual faults that I need to work on. And really the importance of growth in the virtues. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, when I was a Protestant, it's not like Protestants think you shouldn't be virtuous. They do think you should be virtuous, but they fundamentally disconnect the essence of the spiritual life from the pursuit of virtue. That's really kind of accidental to the question of salvation. And, and when it comes to marriage, you know, there's a kind of utilitarian value in being patient and giving with your spouse and so forth. But for a Catholic, that's really the essence of the nature of the, the covenantal union, right? And of course, the Catholic Church's teaching on sexuality raises that dimension of marriage to a, to a level of dignity that I had no knowledge of before as I was a Protestant. Um, so it really it transformed everything, transforms my view of reality, my view not only of marriage, but of the human person, human dignity, um, the nature of vocation. You know, growing up um, within the Protestant community that I lived in, there was a real sense that, you know, you had to do something for God and it was always framed in terms of, well, you know, when you're out there in the world and you have a profession, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, an engineer or a truck driver or whatever it might be, you know, you, you do that for Jesus so that you could witness to the faith in the world. And the almost, no one said this to me, but the implicit sense I had was, you know, home life is kind of home base for me to go out and do my ministry, whatever that might be. You know, the idea of the priesthood of all believers, I'm out there to witness for Christ. And when I became Catholic, I realized that there's a completely different model of vocation, that my first orientation, my, the gift that God has given me, the way that I live out my fidelity to Christ is first and foremost in my family life and in my home. And that I can witness to my neighbors, but it doesn't have to be handing out tracts on a street corner, although you might do that. Um, I should witness to my neighbors by the quality of the moral life that I live, the quality of the marital life that I live, by the way I raise my children, the, the, the effect that it has on me personally, so that hopefully people will ask me, like Peter says, for the reason that the hope of the hope that's within me. And then I can say, well, let me tell you about that. You know? <laughs> that's, that's lovely, very lovely. And, you know, when we really recognize and begin to understand that our faith is to infuse every aspect of our life, right? And when we really begin to strive to live that, uh, we're going to come up against those challenges. We're, we're going to rub against the grain of the world. And we have to be willing to do that. And I know, Father Chris, you know, you are like a YouTube king. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> we're, we're just waiting for the day we get our cancellation letters. <laughs> well, you know, I think that that's going to become the gold standard, right? How well are you living the faith if you've been canceled from YouTube and Facebook, you know? Uh, but the fact of the matter is, in so many of the videos that you have uh, produced for uh, YouTube, and I've had the privilege of watching them and listening to them as I'm driving around and all, you, you talk about the importance of our Blessed Mother at this moment in time. And it's been interesting to me because, you know, I, there is a prophetic reality to the apparitions of Our Lady. She comes really as prophet. Uh, she comes to underscore some aspect of sacred scripture or teaching of the church that we need to know, or, you know, to guide and direct and correct something that is going sort of in the wrong direction. And one of the interesting uh, aspects of these videos that you've produced is this correlation between the various apparitions of Our Lady and the message. And I think, you know, as a mother guides her children, uh, Mary wants to guide us as her children. So share with us a little bit about how you see, you know, the, the, the gift from heaven of our Blessed Mother through these apparitions and her messages uh, impacting and leading and guiding us that we might do, as David was expressing to us, embrace the fullness of who we are and step into the world and the conflicts of the day and make that difference we're called to make. Absolutely, and let me begin by saying an honor it is to be with this panel. I, I've worked with you, Jeanette, with your show. I love your show. It's absolutely beautiful. And if you, I'm sure most of you have already heard Father Wade, but, but Father Wade is a priest that I've always looked up to because if you look and listen to his talks, you will hear absolutely nothing but the truth <laughs> and the truth presented 
um, <laughs> in, in such uh, a, a, an awesome way. And I just did a talk on Saturday where I put Deacon Harold's picture actually up on the screen. <laughs> and I said, I love this guy. I said, this, <laughs> this guy... Uh, has the courage and the fortitude right now, and half of my talk on Saturday was Deacon Harold's quotes, um, <laughs> talking about the importance of seeing what's happening in our culture today and how we answer it. And, and uh, Dr. Andrews, I, I know of his work as well right here on EWTN. In fact, I turned on the app, if you guys were following along, hearing, thinking, oh, maybe this show is on live right now, and it was Dr. Andrews. You're on, you're on TV right now. <laughs> and so uh, God bless uh, for this panel. It's wonderful. But yes, the Blessed Mother is something, in fact, we as the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, we were the first men's community in the world to bear the title the Immaculate Conception. This was hundreds of years before the dogma was ever declared. This was an honor for our community to bear that, and we know as Catholics we hear that all the time. Well, Mary was not without sin. She, she said she needed a Savior. Well, of course she needed a Savior to maintain her being sinless in the first place. Well, secondly, it's nowhere in Scripture that Mary was, was immaculately conceived. Well, look at Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 says there is and will be complete enmity between the woman, her seed, and the serpent and his seed. If you are to have complete enmity, you cannot at all have the influence of Satan. And if Mary had any sin whatsoever, if she had any sin, especially uh, original sin, that would mean she was at least partially under the sway of Satan. She was at least partially under, all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, are at least partially under the sway of Satan when we commit sin. And so if Mary was guilty of any sin, including original sin, Genesis 3.15 makes absolutely no sense. Because it says there is complete enmity. That means Satan cannot have even the slightest sway or control over Mary. So Mary has earned that. Yeah, it's absolutely. And Mary, the other favorite thing I get is when we get all of our hate, I call it hate mail. Um, <laughs> And you know what's funny? When, when we post a video, the pattern is amazing. When we post a video, the first two to three days are wonderful. All positive comments. We love this. This is, the, you know, shouting for the truth. God bless the, the church. And then day three <laughs> starts the hate mail. And the reason is because those people are now sharing it with with their fallen away brothers and sisters, mm. with their atheistic uh, relatives, with their co-workers. It's like clockwork. Every first day is wonderful. The second day is great. But at the end of that second day, here comes the hate mail. By the third day, you're going to burn in hell, you heretic. <laughs> and so we, one of the things that we get in the Miri hate mail is that this is demonic. And mm -hmm. the first thing that I always ask them, with as much love as I can muster, <laughs> is where has any message of Mary ever gone against Scripture? Where? Give me one word of Mary. Lords, La Salette, Fatima. Where? Give me one example of Mary's words that has gone against Scripture. Her entire purpose of her existence is to lead us to Christ. It's not to Mary instead of Jesus. It's to Jesus through Mary. As St. Louis, yeah. It's, it's as St. As Saint Louis de Montfort tells us, the world, Jesus came to the world through Mary. So why are we not going through Mary? To get to Jesus. And, and that's the whole important thing. And last thing, I, I don't want to answer too much on this, but people always say, 
the, probably the most common, it used to be call no man your father. That used to be the number one complaint that I would get out of the thousands of comments. And by the way, I read every single one. I read every single YouTube comment. And we get tens of thousands. I read every single one. I can't always respond. But the number one used to be call no man your father. And we've answered that one many, many times. But the most common now is there's one mediator between mm -hmm. God the Father and man, and that is Jesus Christ. This is Paul in 2 Timothy. The answer is yes, of course there is one mediator. But that is the mediator between the Father and us. Only Jesus. Mary's not the mediator to the Father. Mary takes us to Jesus. Jesus takes us to the Father. And, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, finish, I'll finish with this. The word in the original Greek for mediator, when I talk about the one mediator, is not monos, it's eos. And eos in the Greek does not mean soul. It means sub, or in the first in a series. So that means Jesus, as the one mediator, eos, is the first mediator, or, or the mediator, but there are sub-mediators. It's not, it's not parallel in the sense of equal to, but there's sub-mediators. You're a mediator. When you pray for me, I'm a mediator. When mm -hmm. I pray for Deacon Harold or, or, or Doctor, I, we are all mediators for each other in a mm -hmm. sense. We're not mm -hmm. the mediator, but we are a mediator. And that's Mary's role. Mary's role is to bring us to Jesus who then takes us to the Father. So I finish by saying, how did, how did Peter come to Jesus? Andrew. How did Nathaniel come to Jesus? Philip. If it wasn't for Andrew, we don't have Peter today. Peter came to Jesus through, through Andrew. And what better way to come to Jesus than through his mother? Mm -hmm. So Amen. sorry for the long answer. <laughs> Well, it was a really good answer. Sorry. It was a really good answer. And, you know, it occurs to me in, in, in our first segment there, you know, I made mention of the fact that St. Louis de Montfort tells us in True Devotion that in the latter days the greatest saints will rise up, and it's later now than it was then. So we're all called to be saints. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, Father Wade, you know the saints. I mean, in every talk you give, you give us list after list of beautiful quotes from the saints. So let's talk for a moment about yeah, the right. devotion that all of it. the great saints had to Our Lady and how we can emulate that. Great question. Uh, one thing I definitely want to say to preface it, my answer, is this. One thing I cannot tell my congregants enough is this. For the Catholic Christian, reincarnation is a heresy. Mm -hmm. The catechism is very clear about that. So this life is it, this average of 78 years according to the latest longevity statistics for those of us living in the West. So Almighty God our Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knew from all eternity, all eternity, even before the six-day creation, when Johnette Williams would live, when St. Teresa of Avila would live, when St. Peter the Apostle would live. And remember, there's no reincarnation. This is it. He knew from all eternity when each one of you and each one of us would live. Faith thus tells me that He has created me and you, each one of you, each one of us, for this particular time. And so, therefore, faith also tells me that He must know that Father Wade's up to the task. He must know that Johnette's up to the task. He must know that this person is up to the task and Father Alar is up to the task because He's called us to this particular time. And so, we look to the saints who have come before us, and this is the answer to those who love the Eucharist, to those who love the Blessed Mother, who look to her as a maternal guide, as a mother loves her children, to those who look to the saints who came before them. Uh, when when uh, St. Teresa of Avila writes about the apostles, for example, uh, it just builds me up because each saint is building their life upon those who came before them. And this is the model which ties into the mediation that Father Chris was just referring to. We look to those 
who have come before us as well. I think Satan's mad right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so we look, we look to these models uh, of, of the saints and what it is they did precisely to guide us. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that that is, is the beautiful gift that we have through this legacy of our church, right? Through, through the uh, annals of time, we can go back to these great men and women who, if we spend time getting to know them, can show us through their own life's witness the way in which we should go. And, and I'm thinking, uh, David, that, you know, here you are, a convert to the faith, and this must be a new discovery in so many ways for you. And how have you been able to reconcile this? Because as we said earlier, so many of our family members have fallen away. So many of our Catholics have run off to non-denominational non churches, for example. So how do we approach this so that we can help others to come to this recognition of who Our Lady is and, and who the Eucharist is for such a time as this? Yeah, thank you. So I, I really think there, there are two different answers, two complementary answers to that question. And I've done a lot of studying on the question of why people leave the Catholic Church. Most people don't leave the Catholic Church because they're offended at Marian dogma. Uh, in fact, it's, the, the teaching of the church is rarely the reason why people, why people leave. They, they typically leave uh, because they've been badly treated by some Catholic person, a priest, or a particular community. And I, I, and what they find outside, oftentimes, particularly if they go to a non-Catholic church, they may get invited to a Bible study or something like that, is they find a sense of community that they didn't have in their Catholic parish. And so I, I really think we cannot talk about evangelization uh, and apologetics without attending to our own problems without looking inward to seeing where are we failing uh, as individuals and as parishes and as dioceses to really manifest the love of Christ and to create structures within our parishes that, that are not simply bureaucratic but are, but are mission-oriented, that are people-oriented, that are seeking to help people reconcile their lives to God through the love of their neighbor. And, um, and so that's, that's essential, right? People, all the popes have been telling us in the 20th century that our civilization listens to uh, witnesses more than teachers, right? We have to be witnesses by the transformation of our lives, and not only as individuals, but as institutionally, as the church, our parish, our diocese, all the rest of it. We have to do that. Uh, apologetically, I mean, for, for me, coming to Our Lady, I, I, I did it in a sort of roundabout way. I, I I recognize that Marian dogma was a barrier for me and for many Protestants, um, but I didn't, I didn't come in the direct route. Rather, I, in my studies of Reformation history, that's my background, I'm a scholar, historian, um, I had to deal with the problem, problem as it were, of, of relics and devotion to the saints more generally. And I remember uh, reading a book by a secular historian, Peter Brown, very famous historian of late antiquity, about the cult of relics in Latin antiquity. And uh, him and also a scholar by the name of Ramsey McMullen. And both of them taught me that you could not go anywhere in the ancient world, anywhere, it, whether it was Latin Rite or Eastern Rites, wherever, and not find devotion to the saints and their relics. And in fact, archaeologically, you can track the progress of Christianity in the ancient world by looking for the cult of relics, right? And uh, St. Jerome wrote a treatise about this uh, in the fourth century, and he said to a man named Vigilantius, and he said, does the bishop of Rome do wrong when he offers the holy sacrifice over the bones of the martyrs Peter and Paul? And not the bishop of Rome only, but all the bishops throughout the world? I mean, that's the definition of Catholicity, right? And so, as a, as a Protestant historian, <coughs> reckoning with this, I thought, okay, I've got two choices. I can, I can sever any connection with Christian antiquity. If I reject the cult of saints, I just have to throw away the ancient church altogether. But no Protestant really wants to claim that they're not in continuity with ancient Christianity. Or, if, or I have to investigate what this thing is all about, right? And then I, that led me into some thoughts like the ones you are articulating about what is the nature of mediation? What is the nature of Christ's mediation? How does that affect his body, the church? And I realized, you know, St. Paul says, we have become 
Christ's co-laborers as if God were making his appeal through us. Mm -hmm. St. Paul can say, I fill up in my own flesh what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. And even the Old Testament, I mean, back in Genesis 18, Abraham to, says to God, will you destroy the wicked if I can find 10 righteous people? And God says, I'll spare the many for the sake of the few. Or at the end of the book of Job, where God tells Job's companions, I'm not listening to you guys, but ask my servant Job to pray for you and I'll listen to him. I, I kept finding this pattern of the righteous interceding on behalf of the few throughout the entire Bible and recognize this isn't some, some Catholic innovation. This is really essential to what redemption means, that we can be a body and express that charity for one another. And one of the principal ways we do that is through prayer and intercession. Why would I think that a simple thing like death would end that, right? If the saints intercede for us by their prayers in this life, why would they, why would they stop doing that when they're in glory and confirmed in holiness? And so once I kind of swallowed the big pill of the saints, it was easier for me to reconcile Our Lady because I thought, well, she's just the greatest of the saints. It's, it's like, you know, and that's why we have Julia hyper -Dulia. Well, you have brought us to the end of our time together today, and I want to thank each one of you for being part of this panel and this very, very important discussion that we're having. And what I want to say to all of you is we are called to be the saints of this our day and time. And I think that we have received our marching orders from everybody today, so let's go out there and do it, amen? Yeah.